What is the most favorite verse in all of America? John 3.16, that's a good one. Psalm what? So there's the guy. He already got it. Just give up now. <laughs> Psalm 23, let's turn there. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23. And we'll read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, help us this evening as we look a little closer to this uh, great, great psalm. And so, Lord, uh, speak, to our, speak to our hearts. Help us to have hearts open, ready to receive, ready to respond, ready to have you speak to us individually and make us what we ought to be through this psalm. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The 23rd Psalm is probably the most familiar. I, I, I went out on a limb because, yes, John 3.16 is, is incredibly par- popular as well. And you probably have your favorite, favorite, favorite verse. But I think of all the verses, probably the most well-recognized and the, and the most often used in funerals, I've done probably 100 funerals in my ministry life, Um, is the 23rd Psalm. Uh, People that aren't even saved can recite the 23rd Psalm. And of course, uh, most Christians, you don't have to be saved very long to to learn the 23rd Psalm. And so tonight, number one, is that phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. But he's not just any shepherd. He's not just any shepherd. He is, number one, he's the, the good shepherd. That's what the Bible tells us in John chapter 10, verse 11. The Word of God says in Jesus speaking, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Sheep can't protect themselves. Uh, Listen, all we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah said. But, But here's the thing, and don't get offended. Sheep are dumb. I'm from Montana originally. Um... We lived next to the stockyards. And all kinds of animals went through the stockyards. Sheep are dumb. Sheep can't protect themselves. They have no defense and uh, mechanism. They have no ability to be able to defend themselves. And so they are easy prey for, for predators. The Lord is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He he's he's the one who watches out for us. He already gave, our shepherd gave his life for us sheep. Not only that, he's the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd. In Hebrews 13, 20, now the Lord God of peace, now the God of peace, I'm sorry, the God of peace that brought again, brought, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. He's the great shepherd. Excuse me, just a minute. I don't know my mouth is so dry this evening. He is the great shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd. Because through his blood, we are able to enter into that covenant of salvation. And by the way, that covenant of salvation, it could only be broken by the great shepherd, but he'll never break it. Because he's the great shepherd of grace as well. And then he is, the Bible calls him the chief shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, the Bible says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, 
Peter was addressing those who, like myself, were in the pastorate. Brother, uh, Brother Hoover was in the pastorate for uh, three decades or more. And, uh, and, uh, and so Peter's addressing those that are ministering the Word of God. And although pastors are often referred to as shepherds as well, they're, they're not the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and they sure are not the chief shepherd. They're not the chief shepherd. Only the Lord Jesus is. Now, he's the shepherd. We're the sheep. The saved are his sheep. The lost are not his sheep. Uh, only the saved, only the born-again child of God is one of the sheep fold of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a purchased item. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, great passage, but other passages uh, similar to this. It says, for we are bought with a price. What is that price? It was the price of, of Calvary. We're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Are we doing that? Are there vices in our life that we'd be ashamed if the Lord Jesus all of a sudden appeared in front of us while we're smoking that cigarette or drinking that booze? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Which are what? Which are God's. We're purchased. We don't know. Listen, born again child of God, you don't own yourself. You have no business calling your shots. The only business you have is to get on your face and ask God what he wants. Wait on the Lord. Find out from God. And listen, by the way, you know, you think of these psalms, the psalm of David, okay? Well, how did, how did we get Psalm 23? Did David just uh, eat pepperoni pizza in Jerusalem and all of a sudden he had, you know, this epiphany of Psalm 23? No. Now think about this for a minute. You know how he got Psalm 23? Because the Holy Spirit of God was speaking to him. Does the Holy Spirit of God speak to you? You heard, how many were here when Brother Coomer was here? Raise your hand. You know, he says, he says, you know, ask questions, listen, ask questions, listen, ask questions. Our, our problem is we're impatient. Our, our problem is, is that we try to rush through it all. David got Psalm 23 in a number of different psalms the same way that Brother Coomer was teaching and preaching about. Lord, what would you have me to what would you have me to do today? Holy Spirit of God, who would you have me to witness to today? Holy Spirit of God, is there anything that is between me and thee right now? Is there any sin in my life that that is standing between me and thee. Please reveal that to me so that I might confess it and repent of it and, and be able to walk with thee. We're the purchased property and we're to glorify God in our body and spirit, which are God's. The spirit of God needs to control us. Would you not agree? But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't end there. The Lord is my shepherd, and the verse goes on, doesn't it? I shall not want. I shall not want. Christ, as my shepherd, he supplies every need I have. Now, I meant need, not greed. But, you know, I've asked congregations before, has God even gone over and above your needs in providing things for you? And every single time I ask that, it's unanimous in the, in, in, in the Christian world. Because God is, he's a God that not only meets needs, but God, listen, God loves that we trust him, believe in him, pray to him, and he wants to bless us. 
He's not some angry God that was invented by the Catholics and other religions that's sitting up there waiting to just knock your stinking head off. It's sickening what religion has done to the image of God. But God's not like that at all. He's not like that at all. By the way, he's in this room. He's in this room right now. He's trying to speak to you and I. He's in this room right now where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst. Well, I don't know how many Christians we have in the room, but every Christian in the room has the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. So God's in the room. And uh, the, the psalmist said, and I shall not want. I love the little girl who quoted Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. I like that. That's the way it should be. Amen? Well, then look at the next part of the passage. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Why does the shepherd make the sheep lay down in green pastures? Well, I, I think it's pretty obvious he wants them to rest. Uh, why, why in the world do you and I lay down? I won't put recliners in this, in, this, uh, in this sanctuary for fear of what would happen. But I tease all the time, you know, some people get their best sleep under my sermons. But, but <laughs> the, the sheep need rest. They need rest. And, and so it's, it's, it's important for us to look at this. There are obstacles ahead that only God sees. We see this little dot in front of us. This is life right here. This is life. We can't see too much more. God, in, in his omniscience and perfect foreknowledge, he sees everything all the way to the end. And because of that, he knows that you're going to need to have some strength. Because, listen to me, Christian, there's mountains coming in your life. You say, oh, pastor, man, I've been climbing a mountain already. Okay. But understand on the other side of that mountain is a valley. You get to rest maybe a little bit. But, but we need additional strength for the things that God can foresee are in our future that we don't even know about. We don't even know about. And it's important for us. It's important for us. You know, um, many of you, most of you, I think all of you have prayed for Betty. And thank you for that. And I'm I'm happy to report, and I believe it's, I haven't even looked at the prayer bulletin yet, but I believe it's in the prayer bulletin too. You know, praising God, Betty uh, passed the stress test. It was was canceled three times, and (laughs) the fourth time was a charm. She went through that with flying colors, nothing wrong. No reason not to move forward. We saw the neurosurgeon yesterday. He scheduled surgery. His scheduler called and scheduled surgery for the 28th of December. We're thankful for that. Now, who in the world, who in the world is excited? Betty and I were excited. We said, praise God, what a great day. Who praises God and what a great day for surgery? Well, we do. We do. And God knows what what is needed down the road. It's been a long, it's been a long two plus years, two and a half years for Betty, uh, almost three years of, of of battling some of this stuff, uh, clear back into 2018. And uh, and so you know, but God knew all that, and God knew, and I'm telling you, God knows you. And he knows what's ahead. And sometimes, boy, we just need to sit back and relax and rest and, and just not get all worked up and all impatient and, and all, you know, about what's going on around us. God already knows. God already knows. Uh, we don't know what tomorrow is. We don't even know what tonight is. We don't know what tomorrow is. Boast not thyself of of the morrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. But God knows. God knows, and God knew that 
uh, day before yesterday was coming. He knew yesterday was coming. And uh, praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. And if the rapture comes on the 27th of December, we're tickled to death. We're tickled to death. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures because he is a loving shepherd. He's not going to drive. Listen, a sheep herder drives sheep. A shepherd leads. A shepherd leads. Number four, look at, he leadeth me beside still water. You know, uh, I, you know, I've been uh, over my, in my life, I've, I've been out in the wilderness. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's nice to come across a, 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 a cold stream and get a fresh drink of water out of it. He leadeth me beside still water. Why? Because he wants to refresh us. Because we need that. Besides, listen, many could go without food for days. But none of us can go very long without water. And so, and still water's nice. It's easy to get a drink out of a nice, clear, cool uh, mountain uh, stream. And there's a little, little cut out where the, the, the current isn't going right through it. And there it is. And you can dip in and, and get yourself a nice, cold drink of water. He leadeth me beside the still water. Number five, he restoreth my soul. Now, listen. He knows what we need. He knows what America needs. Listen to me, Christian. If Christendom would get revived, America would get in revival. When God's people want to want to absolutely Surrender, submit 100% and not get up and say, well, uh, uh, I want to submit, Lord, and then we go back to the same stuff. We need revival. The Hebrew word for the word restore is renew. It, it comes with that, de that, that definition, comes with that, that meaning. Renew. Well, listen, you can't be revived unless you've first been vived. You can't be revived. You have to, listen, it, it, the only people that can get revived are born-again children of God. We need that. All of us need restoration from time to time. I mean, it is so easy to get off the rails these days. And everybody's got a short fuse, it seems like, in our culture today. And it seems like everybody's emotions and feelings are right on the razor's edge. It doesn't take much, does it? It doesn't take much for somebody to get twisted out of shape. My, my deacon vice chairman, Brother Terry McLean, he likes this verse. I think this is life verse. Psalm what? Someone help me. Psalm 119, 165. How many could recite that verse? Three of you. Brother Terry, recite it for us. Great. There you go. We got to make sure we're not following the word, the world. In its emotions and and easy to offense. Restoration. He restore. What does he restore? He restores my soul. What's the soul? The soul is me. This body is not me. Aren't you glad your body is not you? Unfortunately, we're stuck in it. How many? How many can't wait for the new body? Huh? Huh? The new and improved version. As sheep were prone to wander. And if you found yourself wandering, do you know that at any moment you can come back and here's the arms of the Lord right here. He didn't go anywhere. He didn't go anywhere. He's right where, he's right where we left him. He's right there. 
And then notice, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, I love this part of it. Because, because we need direction. We desperately need direction. Because we can't see the whole picture. We need direction from the one who can see the whole picture. Are you with me? In John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They don't follow everyone else. They don't follow themselves. And where does he lead us? He lead us, leads us in paths of righteousness. I don't know about you, but it looks like in our day and time, right has become wrong and wrong has become right. And God says, woe unto them. But I don't want that to be me. I don't want that to be you. Amen? God directs them through his word. If you're not much in the Word, you're never going to know the will of God for your life. Never. The Holy Spirit of God is going to bring things out of the Word that you never saw. You say, oh, I've read the Bible through cover to cover multiple times. And start over. And I promise you, I promise you that the Holy Spirit of God will show you something you never thought was even in the Bible the last time that you went through. And ask the question, Not only where does he lead us, but why does he lead us? Well, it says in the verse, for his name's sake. For his name's sake. Listen, God's reputation is at stake in your life, Christian. Are you listening closely? God has connected his name and his glory with the walk and the conduct of his people. When our testimony stinks, shame. Shame becomes the attitude toward our God. When we sully our testimony as a born-again child of God, I just want you to know I'm a Christian. And how many Christians, their lives completely stink it up for the Lord? Completely. Psalm 25.10 All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. You know, it's easy to try to be a good testimony inside the four walls of Elmwood Baptist Church. But how about being a great testimony on the outside of the walls of Elmwood Baptist Church? You know, a, a, lot of, a lot of Christian families, a lot of Christian parents have lost their children because they didn't have a good testimony for Christ in their home. They were hypocrites at church, evidenced by the fact that they went home and they didn't, uh, they didn't act like Christians. I preached on this Sunday morning. I'm not going to re-preach the message. But I I, I will tell you that, that honestly, if we don't live what we believe seven days a week, 365 days a year, the, the fallout usually, usually is in the kids. It's in the kids. And let that sink in. Because you have one shot at this. You have one chance at this. And when that's gone, it's gone. You have one chance to raise up your children in righteousness and love the Lord and live for the Lord and marry the right person. And all of those things are mighty, mighty important and need to be prayed about right this second. Boo-boo's in diapers. Great. Start praying that he marries the right person. And if you start there, you're going to be praying for a lot of years before 
he runs into that right person, but no time like the present to start. And a number of other things. But don't be a hypocrite. Next, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Wow. Do you realize, beloved, sometimes we don't pause enough in Psalm 23, but do you realize that short of the rapture, this is exactly where we're going? We're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Night before, day before, day before yesterday, Missionary Tom Godet, he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible reminds us, for to, for, for to, me, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And you know, it seems like every time I ask folks, Hey, how many are praying and hoping for the rapture? Every hand goes up. And that's what we all want, isn't it? We want to go be with the Lord. We want to go to heaven. We want to be reunited with loved ones that have gone on before us that were saved. But you know, this thing of of death can sometimes cause us to wonder. If God allows a physical death to take place in us, I want to die like a Christian. How about you? And God help me to die like a Christian. Help me to die like a Christian should die. And by the way, you say, well, death kind of worries me. Well, listen, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. Don't be anxious for it. But I understand. It's not really death that scares me. It's how I die that scares me. Maybe that's you. I, listen, um, I, don't want to be get, I don't want to be eaten by a great white shark. How about you? How many want to be eaten by a great white shark? Nobody. I'll tell you what, I caught myself on fire a number of years back ago when I was a fairly new Christian. I've experienced what it's being, what it means to have your clothes on fire and it's burning you. I don't want to be, I don't want to go in fire. Something about fire. God created fire. <laughs> By the way, it wasn't some stupid caveman. It was God who created fire. <laughs> God, God sent fire down from heaven. Made sure I, all those Old Testament people had matches. And if you believe that, I just started to cold. But I, I, I tell you, I tell you, there's something about somebody jumping out of a skyscraper that that should get everybody's attention, and that attention is fire is horrendous. So, you know, it's how you're going to die. Well, listen, but God's got that under control too. So our prayer ought to be just, God, I want to glorify you in life, like Paul said, and I want to glorify you in death. I want, whatever realm it is, I want you to be glorified. But understand that the valley could be a valley of sickness. It could be a valley of, I mean, Betty's been sick uh, for quite some time trying to get on top of this but it it could be a valley of financial loss it could be a valley of grief sadness tragedy it could be the valley of the shadow of death but understand the wording there shadow cannot separate a believer from the Lord. But neither can death. We ought not to be afraid of shadows. When you go out here tonight and you walk into your car, the light is going to be behind you and you're going to cast a shadow. 
Nobody goes, oh, who's that? So we're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But the psalmist David said, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Isn't it great that God's with us? One of the most one of the most comforting passages in all of God's word is Isaiah forty one ten. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Don't you love that passage? Hebrews 13, 5, I don't have it in the PowerPoint, but you, you know the first part of that, that, that we're not to be covetous. God doesn't want us to be idolatrous. Covet, coveting is, the Bible identifies it as, as coveting is identified as, as idolatry. God wants us to understand that that. I am with thee, that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God has promised that. Christian, God is right there with you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. Oh, how many times have we forsaken the Lord? How many times? And yet he's never forsaken us. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Verse 9, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod speaks of authority. The staff speaks of direction. And there's comfort in direction. And the shepherd provides all this. He provides that comfort. He provides that direction. And he does that when we're in the midst of the valley. And he does that when we're on the mountaintop. And he does that every place in between. And all we have to do is wait on him. All we have to do is trust him. And if we do, if we don't lose heart, if we don't throw our hands in the air and say, what's the use? then we're going to see what God can do in His time. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The word prepare means to set in order. God is in no hurry. God is not confused. God will allow no disturbance to get in his way and his will. The enemy is at the door of the psalmist, and yet God prepares a table for the believer to sit down, eat as if everything was in perfect peace. If you read through the Psalms, David talks about how God delivered him from 10,000 thousands of his enemies. I imagine I got a couple enemies, but I don't think I have 10,000 of them. But God, God knows how to take care of the enemy too, doesn't he? And God gives peace to his people. Even in the most trying of circumstances, The doctor says, he mentions the big, ominous C word. I'm sorry to tell you, you have cancer. For some, maybe uh, it's going to get taken care of and maybe it's going to go in remission. Maybe it's going to be completely gone. Aren't you glad you're in a church that can pray? 
But do you know that even in the midst of the most trying of circumstances, their God is. Their God is. And he wants to give peace. Peace. Spiritually, the table speaks of fellowship and communion. You don't invite just anybody to your table. A table is set up and a family sits down. And God sets up a table so that we as his children can sit down and we can have fellowship and communion with God. Are you with me? That'll never be broken. That'll, that'll never cease. Thou anointest my head with oil, the psalmist said. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. Three people in the Bible are anointed with oil. Kings, prophets, priests. Every Christian is called a priest. First Peter 2.9, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. God has called us to serve Him. And He's also provided us with the power that enables us to serve Him. Nobody can say, I can't do that. Sorry, you need to get in your Bible. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The only reason why the words, I can't do that, come out of people's mouth is because they're either lost or they're immature Christians and do not know their Bible. And I was hoping for an amen. God's chosen us. Read, read, read John 15 sometime. That great passage of, of the, the vine. You have not chosen me. But I have chosen you, God says. My cup runneth over. My cup is always running over, Brother Paul. God has provided. God provided abundantly. And when God provides abundantly, your cup runneth over. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it talks about how there's not room enough to contain the blessing. Look at it. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the church. That there may be meat in mine house. The storehouse and mine house are the same house. And this house is his house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the, you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I'm not going to trickle some little thing down to you. I'm going to pour it out. And listen to me. The Christian who is not seeing God bless them abundantly, something is wrong and it's not wrong with God. I am not a prosperity preacher. I don't believe in the false doctrine of every. if you're right with God, you're never sick. If you're right with God, you're a millionaire. That's a bunch of hogwash. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians probably that ever lived, that wasn't his plight. Tell me, how big was Jesus' house? I'm not talking about the one he left. I'm talking about the one he had here. Oh, excuse me. He didn't own a house? Oh, well then tell me about his thoroughbred racehorse that he went around on all the time. Oh, you mean he didn't have any transportation? You see, beloved, God's blessed us with much, hasn't he? He's blessed us with so much. He's blessed Elmwood so much. And you know how he did it? He used you. He used you. I don't know about you, but I don't got $20 bills falling down from the sky into my yard. 
And if you do, please invite me over. But, but you know what? God's people being true and faithful, trusting the Lord, bring all of His tithe. It's His tithe. And by the way, God doesn't need our money. Don't get this idea. God doesn't need our money. The reason why He wants us to give 10% of the gross or the first fruits that He gives to us, the only reason why God requires that is because there's two masters in this world. One is God, the other one is money. And man and many, many Christians are going to serve one of those two gods. And so God says, bring all the tithes into the house of God, into the, into the storehouse, mine house. It's a test of faith. And by the way, if you don't, you're robbing yourself of the blessings. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely is, a, is an assurance word. It means without doubt. And goodness and mercy shall follow me. These are attributes of God. Goodness meets our needs, mercy forgives our faults. Goodness cares for the temporary, and mercy cares for the spiritual. Goodness leads to repentance, and mercy leads to salvation. Goodness is the hand of God, and mercy is the heart of God. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. <laughs> All the days, spring, summer, fall, winter, sunshine, shadows, peace, troubled days, rest, tired, all of it, anything in between. And then the psalmist says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Eternal life can never end. We can never lose it. And he will never take it away. Are you saved? Are you sure you're saved? Tell me, what is your fruit? A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. What is the fruit? Where is your fruit? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that win a souls is wise. The fruit of the Spirit. If you're saved tonight, you got the Holy Spirit, so you should have some fruit. There should be some fruit in your life. I can't see your heart, but we can sure be fruit inspectors. And if your heart's right, there should be some fruit. 